In today's episode, you're going to see, and it's, it's a very practical uh, episode because you're going to see how we can take a higher or lower carat gold and be able to transform it to a working carat that the client may want. Now, in today's episode, the client has 22 carat. We're seeing a lot more of that. Most of the region of um, Central uh, Eurasia, including all of the billion people in India, many, many, many of the, the dowries and the estates contain high carat gold. And by that, I mean above 18 carat. 20 carat would be low. In this uh, case, we actually have some items that are stamped 22 carat. We've uh, been able to test the others as 22 carat. But in the United States, we don't use 22 carat. Oftentimes, we consider it too soft. To maximize the amount of gold that we want out of it, we're going to alloy it not down to 18, but down to 14 and show you how it's done. This is a band, and as you can see, it, it is stamped 22 carat. It certainly has the color of 22 carat. Um, problem is, I could actually take my fingers from either side and squish it uh, into an egg shape. So uh, that's perfect to be able to use. Then we have a charm here. A lot of the old, older charms, of course, from the region were made in 22 carat, and it's got a probably a good fortune symbol on the other side. Sagittarius, I think it is. And this is the kind of gold we get. We call it scrap gold. Here is another piece. It was a uh, coin. This is a coin that was uh, just been what we call a bullion coin. And uh, very, very useful because I know that that will have been made very accurately as 22 carat. Then we have this, um, what actually appears to be a higher carat than 22, but we're just going to call it 22 carat anyway. It's always better to be, have a uh, plum gold, in other words, a positive uh, 14 carat plus than, like, than come out like at a 13 and a half carat, which um, we're uh, not supposed to do in manufacturing gold. Then we have another, that's perfect scrap, post broken off. Here's the other sister piece to it, um, absolutely uh, useless now. Then two little child's earrings, and for the design in the middle, they're actually stamped. That's where the stamp is, 22. So we know what we have. Now I'm going to show you how we get to where we want to be. We have our very accurate scales that we have out, and the ones I particularly am using do carrots out to the thousandth place. So very, very accurate. So we have it set on grams, and it is 6.95 grams total weight of 22 carat. Now, remember, carat gold is based on the number 24, and it is based as a fraction. Simply to understand would be 18 carat. How you would write that would be 18 over 24. Now remember your math, that comes out to, this is very important and will help explain it. That comes out to the percentage when you have 18 divided by 24 of 0.750. Yes, that's where that other number comes from. If you take 14 and over 24, in other words, divide it by 24, that comes out to the fraction 0.585. Those are the European hallmarks used, is the percentage, not the carat system. So it is a different system that you have to understand as well because many, many fine rings, including those made in some of the wonderful Hong Kong factories, will mark their jewelry both ways or just the percentage way. That's how it has gotten to 10 carat, 0.416. Well, 22 carats an unusual one. I happen to know it, of course, off um, the top of my head, but other than that, I would have to get a calculator out. So it is 22 divided by 24 comes out to the fraction, and what the fraction gives you, or the percentage gives you, is how the percent of pure gold in the piece. In other words, 18, the 0 0.750, means there is 75% of the weight of that particular object is 24 carat or 0.999 fine pure gold. Now, 22 carat comes out to 0.916. In other words, 91 and a little over a half, 91 and a half percent of the weight of the metal is 24 carat. So almost all of the weight is the pure gold. That's why we're going to add alloy only to bring it down to 14 
and we're going to choose add alloy right now. We know our weight of 22 carat, 6.95 grams. Now, there is a established chart that is available to goldsmiths because other than that, it's a very uh, kind of complicated formula to be able to move up and down through the different carats. I happen to know that to go from 22 carat to 14 carat, you multiply the current weight you have of the 22 carat or whatever other metal, in this case, it'd be a different factor, but in this case, it's 0.571 times 6.95 will give you the weight of the amount of alloy that you need to add to bring it down to 14 carat and then you have your total weight. Let's show you choices we have of some different alloys. The first one is one that is for 14 carat white gold. It's a uh, multi combination of different metals and it is for fabrication uses. They have different, uh, many other different alloy combinations depending on whether you're casting or rolling it, etc. This next choice is a unusual one. It is to make green gold and green gold you use the same alloy across all the different carats. In the next one we have 18 carat alloy and it has a very high percent of silver. So it won't work really if you're trying to use the 18 karat alloy to be able to use for 14 karat. The next one is a classic. There's probably a dozen different alloys for 14 karat yellow. All these slight variances of color. The one I prefer is a nice bright yellow. And you can see um, the writing of Miss Kimberly, uh, what she has done here. So that I knew it was the bright yellow alloy. The next we have is the rose gold alloy. You use the same alloy, whether it's for 14 karat or 18, and this is the one the client has chosen to use today. We used the calculator. We had 6.95 grams of 22 karat, the multiplier being 0.571. We multiplied the two together. What gives, uh, what we get after that is 3.96, and in this case, grams because that's what we're doing. Now always double check your math. I'm going to run that number again 6.95 times 0.571 equals yes 3.96 grams of alloy. Now I have my scales here. I just put out an indiscriminate amount of alloy so I could uh, drop it into the pan to get to that weight making sure that I still am set on grams because uh, if you bump that number and you're looking at some other weight, grams or carats, you could really uh, mess up your whole process by getting the wrong amount of alloy. We are looking for 3.96 roughly. And if we go a little below, it's better to be a little below than over. That, makes sh that assures us of being accurate. We're at 3.62. I happen to know that probably that one particular emblem piece is pure gold, so it's okay if we go a little bit over. I want to maximize the use of the gold for the client, so I'm going to make sure that we have at least a full 3.65, anywhere in that range. Okay, there we have our alloy. Remember, we're going to lose a little weight in general upon burning out, and it just happens. It just happens. So uh, there's the weight. Now, that's the amount of alloy. So our total weight and what the project is now, we add back in the 22 carat, and now we're going to blend it together. But I will know that I will have roughly 10.65 grams of finished 14 karat gold ready to work with. We have our 22 karat, then the correct amount of alloy that we added to bring the entire mixture to 14 karat. We are going to homogenize it now. I always like that word. Basically, it means mix it together. So instead of using a crucible, I am using a charcoal block. I have hollowed out a little depression in it to where it actually will heat up quicker. There'll be less impurities from a type of flux that we use and it creates kind of a glass uh, glassiness. In this case, by doing it this way, I'm going to avoid that because all I want to do is blend this together because we're going to use it later to roll out in the mill. So 
we have added our, our two different metals together, alloy and 22 carat. What I'm adding is just simply denatured alcohol and a flux called boric acid. It is totally harmless. Um, and the alcohol is only used as a carrying agent so that it coats the different pieces. The use of it is so that it prevents oxidation and it causes the metal to flow together more evenly and smoother. It will burn off the alcohol. It leaves the white residue behind that is the boric acid. I know that sounds terrible, but it is a, uh, a harmless type of product that works wonderful for what we're doing. Now we're going to melt it together. And this is a, uh, always a fun part. And you uh, really get to get interactive with the metal. And you can use a uh, carbon rod to stir it, anything that doesn't melt. You're not going to be coming into contact with the metal, but only a little bit to, to move some of those other pieces. Now, you don't want to really rush it because you don't want to overheat the metal before it's time, so to speak. If you overheat metal in a lot of cases, you'll actually cause a metallurgical problem that you don't want. Let's just leave it at that. I'm looking at the surface. I've got a nice little flow going across. Let's take our niobium um, little solder pick which doesn't melt in high temperatures. Niobium, if you watch Gem Collectors with, show, uh, with Sean's show, you'll know that it's a rare earth element that takes high temperatures. And there's certain uh, presence of uh, being able to find it in some of the Pakistan minerals that I've showcased before. And in cleaning this off, we're kind of just making sure that we have mixed up the metal and I'm cleaning off the little bit of flux residue that is what you want because that is where some of the impurities will lie. And the other thing is I just love looking at that bright glowing mass of a, uh, look at that. So when you get a really nice glass finish like you're get, I'm showing you right now, without that molten metal going to a cherry red, without it getting too hot, this is where we want to be. I can tell that I have full flow and a complete homogenization, if I can say it, of the metal. And look at that oval shape. That is exactly the way I wanted the metal. I'm, it is still totally molten at this point. We have to make sure that it is fully hardened before we remove it. Wow, look at that surface go. You can see it's still moving because it's like magma. The surface is solid, yet the interior was still molten. I just showed you basically how the magma coming in, in Hawaii is working. And it is when you think you can touch the outside and it's solid, only maybe a foot or two underneath, that magma is still molten and extremely hot. Very dangerous. A lot of people get caught off guard by that. And believe it or not, we can actually test this. And I can tell you that you don't want to remove it early. It also will affect the graining of the metal if you remove it while it's still in a molten state. All right, now, you see how it's getting becoming dark? You don't want it to totally go cool because it gets a little more difficult to get out of charcoal that way. But now, when it goes to almost uh, complete loss of all of its other redness, then we know it is solid. And there we go. Now, let's take a look. I know sometimes it's frightening at this point. Let's go ahead and take it over to the pickle pot. We want to do this while the metal is still hot. We get a better reaction uh, for removal of what we want removed. Let's go ahead and drop it in there. Wow, you hear that? That tells you me that it was still plenty hot enough to achieve what we wanted. Now, this is interesting because I already see what it looks like. You saw just then how black it was, how it didn't look like anything of metal to you, did it, or to me. But that is because 
oxidation occurs. It is actually a separate um, oxide that forms over the surface. I love to talk chemicals, but we won't go into that. So let me show you what it looks like now. Now, normally I would actually leave it in here maybe upwards of an hour to make sure that all that flux, which turns into like a glassy residue, is removed. But I'm going to give you an idea right now of, remember, we were looking for rose gold. Let's see if we achieve that goal. And straight out of the pickle pot. Look at that now. We have a wonderful copper or rose looking piece of metal. Let me steam it off and show you a little closer. What we have now is our blended metal, which is 14 karat rose gold. That is how it would be classified. That's how we're going to use it now. We're going to fabricate with it later, so it will involve rolling through the mill and that process. As it is now, it is perfect for that use. Now, if you don't think it looks very rose-like, let me just show you real quick what a identical uh, carrot of yellow gold alloy and uh, standard yellow mix looks like compared next to it. Here it is, even brushed so you can see just how rose gold that is. Classic color, a beautiful look, and now ready to use in fabrication of jewelry. Every step of the process is involves science. You just got to see the interaction of science, math, and the available tools the goldsmith has as part of the process of bringing you a finished piece of jewelry. I hope you have a better understanding of how it's done, and I hope you will join us again.